nature is an important and integral part of mankind. It is one of the greatest blessings for human life. However, nowadays humans fail to recognize it as one. Nature has not only been an inspiration for numerous poets, writers, artists of yesteryears, but also to scientists and engineers. In this video, we will be seeing how nature has inspired mankind and how scientists have used these inspirations to solve problems in various domains. Budgies can perform some of the fastest maneuvers of any bird. They are so skilled, they even sneak in a drink between attacks. It drops like a stone just before the grab. How do all these birds coordinate with each other? What do their movements have to do with the laws of physics? And why is this dance the key to their survival? Have you ever tried synchronized swimming? Or even choreographed dancing of any type? It's very difficult for humans to move in unison with each other. And for the most part, we're just talking about a few of us, not thousands. So how do these birds make it look so easy? How do they make it look like they're all part of one single mass? Do they plan and rehearse their patterns beforehand? Until recently, it was hard to say. But now, with high-powered cameras and computers, scientists have been able to make sense of the phenomenon. The first thing they learned is that the flying patterns have more to do with physics than biology. When a murmuration turns in unison, it's similar to what's known as a critical transition. So there, it's all cleared up, right? Okay, for those of you who aren't physicists, a critical transition can be thought of as an abrupt change that occurs when an external force pushes something to its tipping point. Think of it like this. The giant group movements of a murmuration aren't happening because of any communication between the birds. They're a physical reaction. When an external factor, like an incoming predator, causes one bird to move in a certain direction, that bird bumps into the others around him, causing a massive change of course. It's like when an earthquake triggers the same kind of reaction in the snowflakes of an avalanche or a strong heat source turns liquid into gas. One bird affects the seven closest surrounding birds, and each of those birds' movements affects their seven neighbors, and so on throughout the entire group. This is why a murmuration can appear to have several moving parts, each with a slight variety in speed and direction. But what's the point of it all? Why are all these starlings gathering in one location in the first place? Well, surprisingly, the reasons aren't too different from why humans gather in large groups. For one thing, they like to communicate with each other. Starlings get together to share information, like where to find good feeding sites. The large groups are also helpful for providing much needed warmth during long winter nights and for defending against predators. Just like most species around the world, starlings find safety in numbers. When predators like peregrine falcons dive in for an attack, they find it much more difficult to target one bird when they're all spinning and turning together. Even the smallest murmurations will have about 200 birds in flight. The larger ones can contain hundreds of thousands. In 1999, there was one cluster recorded that consisted of more than 6 million starlings. Imagine trying to pick your next meal out of that. You're not likely to see one that big anytime soon. 
but smaller ones are fairly common if you look in the right places. Collective behavior is all around us. We see bird flocks, fish schools, animal herds. And what really defines these systems is that there's no global orchestrating power. The individual units are locally communicating with each other, and yet remarkably through these types of communication, we get animal groups being able to synchronize their motion and respond to predators in a way that we just couldn't possibly imagine. We're still fairly bad at predicting collective behaviors. And one of the reasons is that there are many emergent properties, properties that you don't necessarily expect based on the individual components. And that's why many of these systems, even relatively simple organizations like schools of fish, are so mysterious to us. Schooling fish have become a very powerful organism for us because like all other vertebrates, they have to solve many challenges. They live in a dangerous environment that's unpredictable. And they have to take in this complex sensory information and translate that into movement controls. And we don't really understand how these organisms do that. When we observe animals like schooling fish, often their responses to each other are extremely fast. It's like a blur when we watch it. But if we use modern technologies like high-speed video, we can slow time down. We can track the motion of individuals hundreds of times per second. And we can then use computational techniques to understand how each individual takes in this complex sensory information and then translates that to movement decisions in, you know, fractions of a second. There they are. They're scared yeah. of something here, eh? Yeah, exactly. That gives us, for the very first time, the data we need to try to understand how the emergent collective behavior arises from the interactions among the individual components of the system. The technology we're developing here is like building a, a microscope to see inside these collective systems in ways that we couldn't before. What we've built here is a much larger tank than people have previously used. And so what we're forced to do is actually to have a four camera system where the cameras are time synchronized with each other. By stitching these four images together, we get this super resolution, slow motion video footage of how the behavior occurs. And so we can begin to understand these waves that cross the group when predators attack. We can begin to understand much better how individuals process sensory information. One of the big current questions in the field of uh, collective behavior is how the behavior of an individual will influence the behavior of the group. In Elad, we're studying groups of uh, damselfish uh, that are actually, it's a species that is endemic to the Red Sea. The species that I'm studying is forming groups from maybe three to four individuals up to 20 or 30. It's hard to collect data uh, with wild animals in general and to study collectives adds a layer of complexity because we have to be able to track all of them. So. We kind of went for a simple system with few individuals so that we can reach very high level of detail in the observations that we are doing. One of the very nice features of these groups of damselfish is that they are attached to a coral head. So they use this coral head for shelter and they live inside the branches. You can easily set cameras around it. They won't move very far and uh, you can track them in the wild doing their natural behavior. We know that there's dominant individuals, subordinates, there's males, females, there's larger individuals, smaller ones. And right now we're really trying to see how these differences can affect the behavior of the collective. The escape behavior in fish is extremely fast. So we have to shoot in high speed. Filming at 120 frames per second, it takes roughly five to six frames for this fish to go back inside of the coral. 
We observe groups in the wild using three cameras that we place in a triangle around their coral head. And then we start giving them the looming stimuli displayed on an iPad. And if they have access to the looming stimulus when it's triggered, usually they would react and then we can collect data on these escape behaviors. Notably, who reacts first and who reacts second, third, etc., which is our main interest in this study. We can start to analyze who has visual access to whom and who has visual access to our stimuli. And then we can disentangle between information that you can see directly and social information that you obtain through uh, the other members of your group. Collective intelligence relies on the individual components to gather evidence themselves towards the problem, not be told what to think. And so we find again and again when we look at animal groups that in actual fact, you know, they've evolved strategies to avoid having overly correlated information. Unfortunately, in human society, we rely too much, in my opinion, on such information. we can learn something by understanding the dynamics of schooling fish and really then apply that to a wide range of other systems from neural dynamics to social dynamics. And so I think it's that insight that there's a collective intelligence, an intelligence that goes beyond the individual, that's embedded somehow in this collective, that's really become a focus of research in the last few years. The travelling salesman problem goes like this. Imagine you're a salesman and you've got to visit a list of cities represented by the red dots. The challenge is to find the shortest route so you visit each city once before returning to your starting point. Now you might imagine the best thing is to just consider all the routes, like this. The method of checking all possibilities is a type of algorithm. And for three cities, it works fine because there are only three possible routes to check. But what if we add two more cities to the list? With five cities, there are 60 different possible routes. And if we add another city, then there are 360 possible routes. And for 10 cities, there are over 1.8 million possible routes. If our algorithm chugged through them, checking all of these at a rate of 10 per second, it would take two days before it found the shortest. So you can see a method of trying all the different possibilities, a kind of brute force algorithm, if you like, is just simply impractical. So if somebody found a fast algorithm for the travel and problem, that would be hugely significant. If one of my students came up with an efficient algorithm for the traveling salesman problem, I would get him to explain it to me. I would kill him, and then I'd go and cl claim the clay prize, a million dollars. But I think my students are safe. The problem crops up in lots of areas, from soldering circuit boards, to planning the routes for supermarket deliveries. But has the travelling salesman problem secretly already been solved? A team of scientists working at Rothamsted Research in Harpenden have turned to nature to see if it has found the answer. They're carrying out an elaborate experiment to study how the travelling salesman problem is tackled by the bumblebee. Bees have to forage for nectar in order to provision their hive. Um, and so they have to visit possibly hundreds of flowers on each trip. What they want to do is find an efficient way to go between all these flowers that they visit. The humble bumblebee faces its own traveling salesman problem. The flowers are just like the cities. And the bee is the traveling salesman. One bee will go out foraging uh, many, many times every day. So over the course of a day, it really helps to, to take the most efficient possible route. 
So what we're doing is trying to figure out exactly what rules they're using to, to narrow down the possibilities. Joe has laid out five feeders which play the role of flowers. Each feeder has just enough nectar to ensure the bee has to visit all five to give it a full honey stomach. And how are you actually uh, knowing where it's going? For this we're using a uh, harmonic radar. So as that spins round and round it's emitting a radar signal and we've attached a small antenna to the back of the bee which then reflects the signal from the radar. And so this allows us to see exactly where the bee has gone as she moves around the field. So how does the bumblebee tackle the travelling salesman problem? OK, OK, switching it on now. With five feeders, there are a total of 60 possible routes. The shortest is around the outer edge. This heat map shows the path taken by a single bee. At first, it's simply discovering the positions of the feeders. Then, the bee appears to methodically change different parts of the route to see if it can make it shorter. Within 20 trips, it's honed in on an efficient route. This route is not always the absolute shortest, but for the bee, it's good enough. That's amazing that just after a very few tries, they've got to something which is, is efficient enough for them to, to do their foraging. Yes, that's right. They can't spend days or even, you know, it could take months or years to try every possibility. So they have to very quickly find a route that they can do again and again and again in order yeah. to efficiently provide food. Fantastic. I, I think the bees become my favourite insect now. So it's obviously a mathematician at heart. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's be clear, bees are not about to be awarded a million dollars. They've not miraculously solved the travelling salesman problem because they don't always find the shortest route. But their algorithm is a clever approach. In maths, it's known as heuristics. Algorithms that are efficient, that don't find the perfect solution, but get as close as they can.